Welcome to the Demystifying Bitcoin track. 12 years into its creation, Bitcoin is just beginning to gain institutional acceptance. To continue to encourage adoption, education is extremely important. And while constructive criticism of Bitcoin is healthy, unfortunately, the mainstream media and influential financial research institutions still dismiss Bitcoin based on stale information and flawed analysis. In this track, we revisit some of Bitcoin's most common misperceptions in the hopes of advancing the discussion and understanding of Bitcoin and the important role it will play in society. Hello, my name is Nick Carter. I'm a general partner at Castle Island Ventures uh, and the co-founder of CoinMetrics. I'm here to talk about Bitcoin's energy dynamics, uh, why it consumes so much energy, and what we can expect from it in the future as the protocol evolves. Uh, this is a very contentious topic, uh, and I think when the facts are considered, uh, it's demystified, uh, you know, we can become much more comfortable with its energy usage. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so the first thing, a key premise for this entire discussion is that Bitcoin has a claim on some of the Earth's resources. Uh, and so Bitcoin is this global, neutral monetary network. Uh, it provides the settlement of value uh, in an apolitical sense without regard for who is using the network. Uh, and it you know, transacts tens of billions of dollars a day uh, and stores the wealth of hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, and it's used by, we don't know exactly, but 50 to 100 million people worldwide. Uh, and so it provides a genuine utility to tens of millions of people. Uh, and so this is a key premise for understanding and conceptualizing any of the energy dynamics, uh, because you have to acknowledge the validity of this network to reason about the costs. If you reject the utility of this network, then no cost, no energy outlay is gonna be worth it. But this is a key premise, and of course, other speakers today will be talking about this far more in depth, uh, so we won't go into it too much. Key premise of the talk, Bitcoin has a claim on some of society's resources, the same way that gold does, for instance. So let's just reset and you know, remember, remind ourselves why Bitcoin consumes any energy at all. So there's really a number of reasons, but there's two primary ones. Uh, so the first one has to do with providing settlement assurances, effectively providing to users of the system the assurance that their transaction will settle, will have finality, and will have a single linear history of events in the Bitcoin system. Uh, and so the miners incur this cost to create new blocks to, for the privilege of adding transactions to blocks. And in exchange for that, they get compensated with new units of Bitcoin and fees uh, and so this energy cost incurred by miners encourages them to behave honestly and to pursue a single linear history of the network as opposed to branching it into other directions or uh, creating these reorganizations where they change the history of the network. The users of the system, they want to have the assurances that their transactions are going to settle, that they're going to be final, and that nothing's going to be changed after the fact. And so the energy cost that accompanies transactions um, and that is incurred by the miners, uh, that is what grants users of the system the strong assurances. And of course, as I said, um, at peak, Bitcoin will process 10 to $20 billion a day in final settlements, uh, and it stores around $600 billion today, although of course that changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so it's providing a genuine monetary transactional utility uh, in a way that's quite distinct from other transactional systems. Additionally, and this is often overlooked, Bitcoin mining is a system of distributing the new units of Bitcoin to the world at large. Uh, and so when Satoshi devised Bitcoin uh, in 2008 and then created it in 2009, Satoshi had this conundrum, how am I going to actually distribute the units of this commodity to the world at large? Uh, you know, Satoshi could have emailed 
uh, you know, their friends, you know, new units of Bitcoin, but that wouldn't have exactly been a, a fair or credible way to initially distribute these units to the world. Uh, and so the method that Satoshi settled on was proof of work, where effectively you have to spend energy and computational resources in order to obtain uh, new units of, uh, of Bitcoin. And so miners themselves, they don't, they're not you know, particularly privileged in terms of their access to the monetary uh, issuance, uh, unlike, say, the Federal Reserve is privileged in terms of uh, you know, access to new dollars. For them, it's costless to create the dollars. Because miners have to incur this cost, uh, they have relatively thin margins historically, uh, and so no one is, uh, you know, able to extract seniorage, able to extract a significant rent from their position as the monetary issuer. Instead, it's this very much free market process, uh, and so proof of work solves this decentralized initial issuance uh, problem, and that's a really key thing to remember as we, you know, consider its sort of energy outlay. So as I said. Bitcoin's security and reliability derives from proof of work. Uh, and so the costliness of the ledger is what links this digital system to the physical world. The fact that there are actual physical costs associated with creating new ledger entries, that links the analog and the digital. Uh, and you know, an analogy here you could consider would be um, Mesopotamian clay tablets you know, from 3000 BC, where these accounting relationships would be inserted onto wet clay and you know x owes y z amounts of barley for instance uh, and that relationship is described on the clay tablet and then it's set outside in the sun to dry and once the tablet is dried that relationship is forever encoded it can't be changed it can't be reversed uh, bitcoin blocks the accumulation of computational work in progressive Bitcoin blocks gives you a similar kind of assurance. Um, once a transaction has occurred uh, in the Bitcoin ledger, once significant sufficient blocks have been mined, that transaction is assumed to be final. And so in the case of the clay tablets, it's the sun's energy, which is providing you that kind of finality and uh, calcifying the ledger and effectively making it robust and immutable. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, it's you know computational work, uh, which does that same thing. Uh, now, a lot of people say, well, why can't we just strip the proof of work out of Bitcoin and insert a system like proof of stake? Well, if you were to do that um, in proof of stake, you would uh, create influence proportional to the number of coins held. In the case of Bitcoin, that would make these large custodians, banks effectively, that control lots of coins on behalf of users uh, it would make them the stewards of the network. It would give them effective control. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the case today that many, you know, a large fraction of all the outstanding Bitcoins are controlled by these custodians. And so if you were to eliminate the proof of work uh, process and impose something like proof of stake um, or delegate control to you know, these third party validators with a lot of influence, you would lose the nice assurances you would lose the decentralization of the network effectively. So as far as we know, proof of work provides pretty unique assurances that aren't recaptured by any alternative system. So as I mentioned before, uh, you know, proof of work has a couple of different functions. One of them is to mediate the initial issuance of new Bitcoins. Uh, and it, it's interestingly the fact that historically, the vast majority of Bitcoin's energy expenditure derives from this issuance. So miners are compensated in two ways. One is through the collection of new units of Bitcoin. And then the second is through fees that users attach to transactions. But historically, the issuance of new units of Bitcoin has dominated their revenue. Uh, it's been over 90% of their revenue historically, with transaction fees being much more minor. Uh, and so when you think about the energy consumption of the Bitcoin system, this is really critical because you have to decompose transactional intensity from minor revenue and hence energy spend. Uh, it's not the case that adding more transactions will dramatically increase the energy expenditure of the Bitcoin network, as a lot of people mistakenly believe. Most of the energy consumption is really a function of the price of Bitcoin and, of course, you know, the value of that new issuance that miners are collecting. 
Uh, that's really what's going to drive the energy consumption over the next few years, not the number of transactions. Bitcoin can scale up the number of transactions um, or the value of transactions without really having a linear proportional effect on the amount of energy that miners are consuming. So it's really in the near and medium term, much more a function of the, um, the price of Bitcoin and the value of the new reward that miners are incurring. And this is kind of analogous to gold. Again, um, you shouldn't think of Bitcoin's energy dynamics as analogous to something like Visa. Uh, you should think of it as similar to gold, where the vast majority of the energy expended by gold, uh, by gold uh, production, manufacturing, extraction, has to do with mining the gold, pulling it out of the ground and refining it. Uh, it has much less to do with moving the gold on trucks or boats or anything like that. It's kind of similar with Bitcoin. Most of the energy outlay in Bitcoin's case is a function of the initial creation of Bitcoins. Uh, and so that's a key thing to remember because gold is this useful commodity that people use to store their wealth outside the confines of the state. The extraction of gold is kind of tolerated, uh, even if it's not particularly ecological. Uh, and same thing with Bitcoin. Uh, the production of Bitcoin is you know, still uh, you know, yields and provides us with a system which is of value to society. Uh, and so it's still, you know, something that we should accommodate effectively. Now, let's just sort of set the table and actually look at some of the numbers here. So as of today, and there is some uncertainty with all these numbers, a lot of them are estimates. Um, we can't have perfect direct knowledge of all these things because miners uh, are kind of hard to get data from. Uh, it's this global set of entities that we can't necessarily triangulate all of who they are. Uh, but, you know, based on our the kind of state of the art knowledge we have today, uh, Bitcoin miners consume about a quarter of 1% of all the world's electricity and about a tenth of 1% of all the world's energy production because the world produces a lot more energy than it does mere electricity. Uh, and so that's kind of where we are. And whether you think that's really high or really low, has to do with your view of sort of the merits of Bitcoin, whether it's a worthwhile thing or not. Um, now, in terms of the actual composition of the energy inputs, that gets much more tricky to assess because we have to determine whether uh, miners are actually using renewable or non-renewable sources. It's kind of hard to know, right? It's difficult to just ask the miners. So the various estimates we have historically Cambridge in 2020 um, ascertained that miners were around 39% uh, renewable. Uh, more recent studies, uh, the Bitcoin Mining Council, which is a group of uh, North American and other miners, came out with some disclosures earlier this year, and they found that uh, within that sample, the sustainability of miner operations was around 67%. If you combine that with um, a conservative assumption for the default energy mix for the world for the out of sample data, you get a figure of around 46% sustainable. Uh, now sustainable means renewable plus nuclear in this instance. Uh, and so that's probably better than the global average grid. Um, now it's again, a lot of that is guesswork and we won't really know what the true sustainability of Bitcoin mining is until we get a better idea of where miners are. Um, but our best guess is that Bitcoin is responsible for around 50 megatons of uh, CO2 emissions uh, per year or around one tenth of 1% of the world's emissions. Now, what does this actually mean? I mean, what does this compare to? So you can compare it to individual small countries as is very commonly done, uh, or you can understand that the world is this sort of highly globalized place and that for the most part, we in, you know, outsource our industrial capacity to one or two major countries which account for the vast majority of sort of energy production and consumption. Uh, so Bitcoin's current energy usage is around, you know, 0.7% of China's energy production and between one to 2% of America's. Um, and so it just really depends, you know, how you want to compare it to, uh, to the you know, global consumers of energy. Um, Bitcoin's energy footprint is 12 times smaller than always on devices in US households. Uh, it's 15 times less than electricity lost in transit globally every year. 
And now I think industry level comparisons are much more elucidating than country levels because Bitcoin is not a country, it's an industry, right? It's an industry that provides uh, monetary assurances, transactions, and savings. Uh, and so, you know, this industry analysis is not that commonly done because typically, as far as policy is concerned, we're much more concerned with, well, what's the nature of the grid? How sustainable is the grid? But you can certainly look at individual sources of energy consumption uh, and you can compare them to Bitcoin if you want. So there's all sorts of numbers here. Uh, Bitcoin is, you know, slightly less than the amount of energy consumed just by domestic tumble dryers globally. And of course, a tumble dryer is a discretionary thing. You can always dry your clothes on the line if you want, uh, but you know, it improves our quality of life. So we accept the fact that it consumes some energy. Um, Bitcoin compares favorably with the energy used by copper mining, zinc mining, uh, gold mining. Those all, um, as far as we can tell, have a greater uh, energy impact. Now, that's not to say that those industries aren't useful. I mean, they provide, you know, genuinely useful metals. This is just to contextualize Bitcoin uh, so you can compare it to other industry level uses uh, of energy. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these industries, whether it's refrigeration, air conditioning, heating, tumble dryers, washing machines, they massively improve our quality of life. So we don't often think that critically about the energy um, requirements of those industries because they brought us into modernity. I mean, they represent the trappings of civilization. Air conditioning meant that we could live in hotter places and just live more comfortably. So we don't regret the energy that's used on them. The same way that we shouldn't regret the energy used for this novel monetary transmission technology. Uh, this is just the mark of civilizational progress, obtaining more energy and then putting it to use in sort of efficient sources that make our lives better. So just to summarize that section, I mean, the perceived merit of an application's energy consumption is really ultimately a function of your own subjective view of that application's utility, right? And so if you don't believe a certain application has utility, you're going to believe that the energy associated with it is a waste. Uh, and certainly a lot of people don't believe that gold is, you know, has a role in modern society. Certainly many people don't believe that Bitcoin does. Uh, but, you know, things like gold is a means of storing your wealth outside the banking system, outside the state. Uh, equivalently, so is Bitcoin uh, in a way that you know, has completely differentiated qualities from these other monetary systems. So to the extent Bitcoin has utility, to the extent we acknowledge it has utility, its energy consumption becomes much more tractable and something that we can get more comfortable with. Uh, Satoshi you know, mentioned this before, saying uh, you know, gold mining is a waste, but you know, gold itself facilitates these new transactions that wouldn't be possible without it. So it's not a net waste. And similarly with Bitcoin, um, the issuance of Bitcoin and the energy associated with that allows us to have Bitcoin, which provides these interesting monetary assurances to tens of millions of people worldwide. Uh, and if you look on sort of a per capita basis and other talks, I'm sure we'll cover this today. Um, we're talking about disproportionate penetration in places with weak property rights, poor governance, high inflation, strong capital controls, places where people are very unfree from a monetary perspective. Uh, and so, you know, not everyone watching this talk will be in a situation like that. Bitcoin may not be that relevant to them. Uh, but rest assured, you know, the highest Bitcoin penetration is in places like Argentina, Venezuela, Turkey, Nigeria, Kenya, these are places where the independent system of property rights proposed by Bitcoin is extremely relevant to these people. So the good news is that Bitcoin mining, unlike gold mining, which re requires, you know, sifting earth and um, refining gold and smelting it down, Bitcoin mining is pretty much a synthetic process. All you're really doing is using computational work to search a mathematical space. And because it's synthetic, that means that mining itself can be as green as the energy inputs that the miners are relying on. And so that's pretty good news. It means that as the grid 
gets more sustainable over time, which we certainly expect it to, uh, mining itself will become greener. Uh, and if you expect this transition will occur and renewables will continue to dominate and the grids, generally speaking, will decarbonize, uh, Bitcoin can completely benefit from this. Uh, and so in you know, 20 years time when grids are green, um, it could well be the case that Bitcoin has uh, fully sustainable production. Uh, the other good piece of news is that Bitcoin is this highly uh, modularizable uh, industry where Bitcoin miners don't necessarily have to be in one place or another. So they can shuttle back and forth um, and, you know, disproportionately procure these sustainable energy sources. So it's you, you could say it's location independent. Unlike a lot of other industries, Bitcoin consumes energy regardless of where that energy is produced. And of course, this is different from, say, household energy production, where energy has to be produced relatively nearby to load centers because it has losses in transmission. Another historical analogy here would be aluminum smelting. So aluminum can be smelted um, sort of in a location independent basis. And this is why you had lots of aluminum smelting in places like Iceland with abundant hydro energy. Um, of course, that required lots of installed infrastructure. So aluminum couldn't perfectly facilitate this energy arbitrage, but Bitcoin can. Um, Bitcoin can be mined with as little as a shipping container full of ASICs. Uh, and so it can disproportionately penetrate those places with cheap and abundant electricity. Uh, and in many cases, that's renewable. So um, historically, this is why Bitcoin miners were disproportionately located in China, because China had the most abundant stranded hydro resources on the planet. Um, China was curtailing 50 to 70 terawatt hours of hydro energy, so simply not being delivered to the grid. Uh, in 2016, 2017, that's why Bitcoin miners went to those southern provinces in China. Uh, so the world doesn't necessarily produce uh, precisely the right amount of energy needed um, that the grid demands. Oftentimes there's imbalances and Bitcoin can exploit those imbalances effectively. Um, wind and solar are a classic example of technologies that don't necessarily generate energy in a way that's suitable for the grid to consume them. Um, you don't necessarily have large uh, suitable solar plants in places that are right adjacent to cities, for instance. And so you see lots and lots of wind and solar curtailment, basically energy that doesn't reach the grid. Now, they don't generate energy in a profile that is suitable for Bitcoin mining today because they're intermittent sources. But as battery technology improves, and I think we can all agree that it is generally improving, uh, they will become smoother in terms of their generation profile and thus more suitable for Bitcoin miners. So that'll be more of a medium term trend. Lastly, globally speaking, the extraction of hydrocarbons is always associated with the production of waste and natural gas. And that gas effectively gets flared or vented off because it's not economical to make it to the market. Now, Bitcoin miners have begun to take advantage of this flared gas um, and effectively um, capture it and turn it into energy to mine Bitcoin with. And now that gas was being flared anyway. So from a carbon perspective, it's completely net neutral. So Bitcoin can take advantage of all of these sources of curtailed, uh, stranded or non-rival, which is to say energy sources which would not compete with uh, you know, load centers with commercial or household demand for energy. And so this location independence is an incredibly powerful trait for Bitcoin. The other interesting thing is that Bitcoin miners uh, are synergistic with grids that are more renewable in their nature. Uh, and this is obviously happening as policymakers prioritize the sustainability of grids. There's just more and more wind and solar that we're seeing part of energy grids. Uh, and now an interesting thing about Bitcoin miners is that they represent interruptible load which means that they can scale down their demand very rapidly and on short notice. So they're perfectly eligible to participate and really suitable 
for these things called demand response programs, which means that when a grid when a grid is very much overtaxed uh, and demand starts to uh, approach or exceed the supply, miners can be part of this industrial cohort that spins down their operations and turns off on short notice. Now, most uh, sources on the supply side of energy cannot spin up and, or down on short notice. Uh, certainly, thermal energy can't spin up or down. Um, so one way to deal with imbalances in supply and demand is to make the demand side more flexible. And so Bitcoin miners are perfect for that, effectively turning down the demand at times of peak load. Um, and if you look at the Texas demand response program, they asked you to turn off your consumption with 10 minutes or 30 minutes notice. Miners can do this. Other sources of demand have a much harder time doing this. So this actually is a counter cyclical feature. The miners buy the energy when supply is abundant and they stop buying the energy when households really need it, when things get extremely constrained on the grid. And so that has this net effect of actually balancing out the grid. And I'm sure we'll see much more of that as more hash rate comes online to the US. Um, the other thing is that Bitcoin miners are a buyer first resort for new energy projects that aren't yet grid connected. So if you're building a renewable project um, and it's going to take some time to integrate it into the grid, miners can be a short term buyer of that energy and effectively improve the financials of that project. So a lot of people say that miners are a subsidy or Bitcoin is a subsidy for renewable energy. That may or may not be the case, but certainly the presence of Bitcoin miners in a grid, especially one that's rendered more unstable by the presence of renewables, which are more intermittent in their generation profile, um, the miners can actually attenuate that intermittency and actually enhance grid stability. So the good news again is there's been a significant focus on the, sta the sustainability of Bitcoin mining, uh, rightfully so, but the Bitcoin mining community has absolutely reacted and we're seeing rapid progress being made towards sustainability. There's a lot happening here. I'll summarize some of the new elements. So first of all, an enormous amount of Bitcoin's hash rate previously was domiciled in China, but that hash rate was very much exposed to these carbon intense sources of energy generation, especially in Inner Mongolia and Xinjiang provinces in certain portions of the year, you get 45% of global's entire hash rate being powered by these two provinces, which were 60 to 70% coal powered in their electricity generation. So during those periods, almost 50% of Bitcoin's hash rate was dominated by these very much coal powered provinces in China. Now, since May of 2021, China has effectively banned Bitcoin mining in the country. Uh, and so around 50 to almost 60 percent of Bitcoin's hash rate uh, has been eliminated from China. It's looking for new homes overseas. We're still in that period where those miners are looking for new hosting. Uh, but what that means is that 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 uh, effective reliance on coal based generation in China uh, has now been eliminated. And of course, there's coal production in other countries like Iran and Kazakhstan, where we know mining occurs, but a lot of those miners are looking for homes in politically stable countries like the US, where the grids are much more renewable. And so the net effect of this migration from Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, to places like Texas or uh, the PJM grid in New York, New Jersey, um, or you know Canada, British Columbia, or Northern Europe, places where miners are already active, uh, that's going to have the net effect of reducing the carbon intensity of that mining activity. And this was an enormous shakeup in the Bitcoin mining space. So we're seeing this migration happening. We're going to need some more time to see where the miners settle. But most likely, this is going to reduce the carbon intensity of the Bitcoin network. Next up, as miners become more Western based as they undergo this migration, they're also becoming more transparent. And this is a reaction to some of the media attention that we've seen on the industry. And I think it's a warranted reaction. So the Bitcoin Mining Council is just one of a number of initiatives to 
increased transparency around what miners are doing and when where their energy is deriving from. So their first disclosure in Q2 of this year assembled 32% of all of the active hash rate, and they found within that sample a 67% sustainability. Uh, and you know they're making quarterly disclosures on an ongoing basis. So I'm sure that we'll see more of this. Um, I'm very optimistic about the quality of these disclosures. And ultimately, this is just going to provide investors and onlookers and academics and policymakers more information regarding what the miners are actually doing. Of course, we can't solve this problem overnight, but simply providing people the informational tools to understand where these miners are and what their actual energy mix is and what their associated carbon intensity is, that's going to dramatically help here. Uh, and, you know, some of these miners are actually engaging in the buying of, of carbon offsets as well. And that's not a perfect solution, but some of them have, you know, committed to becoming completely net neutral by pursuing as sustainable sources of energy as they can and buying offsets for the remainder. Now, this is another consequence of miners being public and being exposed to Western capital markets. Increasingly, and we know this is a priority of financial regulators in this country, um, you know, ESG concerns are a big portion of what, you know, these public market agendas involve. So as capital becomes more accountable to Western capital markets, it has a strong incentive to be more sustainable in nature because increasingly we're seeing the cost of capital rise for firms that fall far outside the norm in terms of sustainability. And so miners now have an additional financial incentive to pursue more sustainable operations. And as miners move from China to the US, that incentive is gonna grow. So we know that they're more sensitive these days and Western miners, we've just seen more disclosure from them and more proactivity from them. Uh, so to summarize, you know, this migration of hash rate from East to West is leading to a more accountable, more known, uh, more identifiable and more sustainable uh, body of miners. Uh, and so, of course, it's still early days and we don't have a complete informational picture regarding the sustainable sustainability of the Bitcoin network. But the trends look extremely positive. And at the end of the day, this is an industry that provides you know, a significant value and utility to tens of millions of people worldwide. Uh, and so I think the prospects for Bitcoin mining are bright. Uh, and I uh, thank you for uh, attending my talk and listening to my presentation. Hello, 
I'm Philip Gradwell, the Chief Economist at Chainalysis. And today I'm here to address a major myth around Bitcoin, and that is that it facilitates criminal activity. Bitcoin has a really mysterious aura around it. It's an exciting new technology with an anonymous creator that promises to revolutionize money, and so potentially even society. But part of the mystery also comes from how many people, sorry, but part of the mystery also comes from how many people first heard about Bitcoin. The Silk Road, operating between 2011 and 2013, was the first place that people could really use Bitcoin. But the Silk Road was a darknet marketplace, a website where you could buy and sell drugs. So the first time that Bitcoin entered the public consciousness, it was related to criminal activity. And that was my personal journey. And I want to share that journey to dispel the myth that Bitcoin facilitates criminal activity. But first to just say how you can dispel that myth. There are just three facts to remember. The first is that Bitcoin, due to its public blockchain, brings unprecedented transparency to economic activity. The second is that due to that transparency, criminal activity on Bitcoin can be measured. The data shows that illicit entities accounted for just 2% of all economic activity on Bitcoin in 2020, a figure that just cannot be calculated for fiat. So 98% of activity, the vast majority, is legal. And third, Bitcoin's transparency also means that criminal activity can be traced and stopped. To give an example of that, when the US Department of Justice announced the takedown of the largest child pornography darknet market site in October 2019, they said law enforcement was able to trace payments of Bitcoin to the darknet site by following the flow of funds on the blockchain. And it's not just law enforcement. Cryptocurrency businesses around the world perform anti-money anti laundering checks using blockchain data to meet their regulatory obligations to disrupt criminal activity. Due to its transparency, Bitcoin has good, if not better, ways of combating criminal activity than fiat. So what is the personal journey that has led me to understand that it is a myth that Bitcoin facilitates criminal activity? I'm the chief economist at Chainalysis, a company that analyzes blockchain data to promote more financial freedom with less risk. Cryptocurrency businesses, law enforcement, and financial institutions use our software and data to manage the risks of criminal use of Bitcoin, as well as to identify the legitimate opportunities. So when law enforcement were tracing payments to that child pornography site I mentioned, they were using Chainalysis software. But my Bitcoin journey started with the Silk Road, although perhaps not how you might think. I'm an economist. So when I read about the Silk Road on the internet, I was blown away by the way in which Bitcoin was facilitating new types of economic interactions. Now on the Silk Road, those interactions were illegal, but it demonstrated to me the potential of Bitcoin to transform all of our economic activity. In the years since then, I've been on a mission to accurately understand how Bitcoin is actually used by analyzing data on the blockchain. By 2021, both our ability to understand how Bitcoin is used and the way it is used has been transformed. As this chart shows, the vast majority of Bitcoin activity is currently trading and investment. The chart shows the source on the left-hand side and the destination on the right-hand side of Bitcoin that is transferred on the blockchain over the last 12 months. The largest flows are between self-hosted wallets. These range from Bitcoin sent from the wallet I have on my phone to Bitcoin held by large institutional investors who custody their own Bitcoin. The next largest flows are to, from, and between exchanges, where people trade Bitcoin for fiat currencies or other cryptocurrencies. And as you can see, illicit entities account for a very small amount of the flows compared to these other use cases, small enough that I've had to highlight them on this graph. And what are these illicit entities? They are the Bitcoin addresses that are controlled by people undertaking criminal activities, such as running darknet markets, scams, or ransomware. And I'll describe these further shortly. But first, I want to give you a sense of the overall scale of criminal activity that occurs on Bitcoin. 
And you can see on this chart that criminal activity accounted for around 2% of all the economic activity on Bitcoin in 2020. And we see some quite large absolute numbers in terms of the dollar value of criminal activity, say sort of $10 billion in 2020. But you've got to understand that these are actually quite small relative to criminal activity in the fiat economy. In fact, in the fiat economy, it's very difficult to understand the level of criminal activity because you can't see the transactions that are occurring and you can't measure it. But there's certainly more than $10 billion of criminal activity occurring. But the level of criminal activity is actually very small relative to the Bitcoin economy. As I showed on the previous chart, there's so much more use cases of Bitcoin going on than just criminal activity. And that is why the overall share of illicit activity on Bitcoin is just 2% in 2020. Now, of course, it was higher in previous years. You see that spike in 2019. And that was actually due to some scams that were particularly successful. I'm going to talk about them more shortly. It's also just important to understand that these numbers are a lower bound and they do change over time. And that's really for two reasons. We identify more criminal activity over time. So that means the numerator gets bigger. And we also remove more noise from our estimates of economic activity on the blockchain. And so the denominator gets smaller. But overall, the key thing to understand is that yes, there is some criminal activity on Bitcoin, but it's a small amount. And as I'll explain later, there are also ways in which it can be stopped. But I also want to talk about the types of criminal activity that does occur. And when we break this down, as we are on this chart here, we see that most of the criminal activity on Bitcoin is related to scams and darknet markets with an increase in ransomware in 2020. And these are serious crimes, which is why, in my view, for Bitcoin to go mainstream, we need to measure, trace, and stop criminal activity. For example, through law enforcement action, regulation, and anti-money laundering requirements. But another key insight from this is the prevalence of scams. They demonstrate the need for a strong community and some good faith efforts to inform people about the right opportunities. Bitcoin contains so many get rich quick true stories that it's so easy for new people entering the space to be sucked in by a scam. So the more that we educate people the more we can actually tackle this major source of crime. And I believe that the entry of more mainstream organizations that can guide people towards the genuine investment opportunities, the smaller this risk of activity there will be. So while there is some serious criminal activity on Bitcoin, it's relatively small and a lot of it is concentrated in scams that can be reduced through greater education and community action. But law enforcement and also cryptocurrency businesses through the anti-money laundering programs are already fighting criminal activity today. And they're actually achieving great success. I'm showing here just a few examples of the law enforcement actions that make it out into the public. And there are many more successful ones happening behind the scenes. And from the perspective we've had at Chainalysis, working with our law enforcement partners, we've really understood that actually Enforcing uh, against criminal activity on the blockchain is sometimes actually easier than it is in the fiat world because of the quality of the data and the ability to follow the money without getting stuck in shell companies and jurisdictions that you can't access data on as you do in the fiat world. Our law enforcement partners have actually managed to do much larger investigations using uh, collaborating with law enforcement agencies across the world at a much greater speed than they would have otherwise been able to do. And another key driver that is controlling the use of Bitcoin for criminal activity is an increasingly strong regulatory framework. People have the misconception that Bitcoin isn't regulated. In fact, because of its early history, its use on the Silk Road, Bitcoin has been under regulatory scrutiny almost from the start. And Bitcoin often falls under traditional existing regulatory frameworks. And in, over the recent years, there's been an enormous amount of effort to build up a more comprehensive regulatory framework specifically for the asset. For example, the Financial Action Task Force, which sets global recommendations for anti-money laundering, has a cryptocurrency framework, and a number of important financial jurisdictions have developed their own cryptocurrency regulations. And so, 
the combination of the transparency of the blockchain, the success of identifying and tracing and stopping criminal activity, and the strong regulatory framework really helps reduce the amount of illicit activity on Bitcoin. And as I've emphasized, there's just a huge amount of data available on the criminal activity and just how it compares to the other far more numerous and positive use cases of Bitcoin. If you want to learn more at Chainalysis, we have a wealth of information uh, on our block. But to summarize, really with Bitcoin, you've got to remember whenever someone says, I think it facilitates criminal activity, you should tell them that actually because the blockchain is public and therefore transparent, we can actually measure the amount of criminal activity that's going on, which you simply cannot do at fiat. And in 2020, it was around 2% of overall economic activity, leaving 98% to more legal, interesting, productive uses. And because of that transparency, it's possible to trace and stop that criminal activity through law enforcement action and anti-money laundering regulations. So thank you very much. I've been Philip Bradwell, Chief Economist at Chainalysis. My name is Arjun Balaji. I'm an investor at Paradigm, a crypto-focused investment firm in San Francisco. I'm here today to talk about how Bitcoin scales and layers. A common refrain you've probably heard is that Bitcoin is unscalable or that it can't securely scale to support global finance. If you've spent any time following Bitcoin over the last decade, you've probably heard this discourse in the media. Media stories about Bitcoin often follow a similar structure. A comparison to Visa or PayPal, describing Bitcoin's transaction fees as very high, and the conclusion that Bitcoin can never scale to support global payments. However, the core question of how Bitcoin scales isn't new at all. It's actually one of the oldest questions in Bitcoin discourse. The very first public comment after Satoshi released a Bitcoin white paper in 2010 was from James Donald, aptly describing this constraint. As highlighted below, he said, if hundreds of millions of people are doing transactions, that is a lot of bandwidth. Each must know all or a substantial part thereof. Put another way, a central tenet of Bitcoin is making sure anyone can easily validate the base layer. And this caps the potential throughput of Bitcoin. The fundamental constraints that exist limit Bitcoin's theoretical transaction throughput between four and seven transactions per second for TPS. In practice, it's been closer to the lower bound, around three transactions per second. It's highlighted on the chart below. This is a far cry from any major payments network like Visa, which claims to hit about 24,000 transactions per second. This is nearly four orders of magnitude higher than Bitcoin. These fundamental constraints come from Bitcoin's inherent block weight and interblock times. 
What this means is that Bitcoin blocks have a limited amount of space to include transactions and that Bitcoin blocks don't happen continuously. They settle on average every 10 minutes. Oftentimes people ask, well, why can't we just multiply all the constants? This is a major point of friction in the scaling debate. And philosophically, this was the major focus of the blockchain block size wars of 2017 and earlier. This is even seen in Elon Musk's recent attempts to propose scaling Dogecoin to support global payments. The short answer of why we can't multiply the constants is that base layer scalability is a trade-off. A really simple model for this is the scalability trilemma, which you can see here, with three prongs, scalable, secure, and decentralized. Any simple scaling solution will find it really challenging or impossible to optimize for more than two out of three of decentralization, scalability, and security. One mental model of Bitcoin is that it's a train which has limited seats and departs at limited times. In order to get a seat on the train, users have to bid for a ticket. That's the Bitcoin fee market. We could decide to make each carriage on the train 10 times bigger, but this comes at a cost. In this case, the cost is all imposed on users who want to run a full node. This directly trades off the decentralization leg of the trilemma. Today, Bitcoin's weight is already over 350 gigabytes and rapidly growing every year. Though hardware improves and storage costs drop over time, making blocks 10 times bigger would likely make it prohibitive for ordinary users to use Bitcoin without trusting an intermediary. The key takeaway is that one does not simply scale Bitcoin by multiplying the constants. So what is the right way to think about Bitcoin scaling? One model is that Bitcoin base layer is a settlement network and that it should be scaled like an onion in different layers. This isn't unique to Bitcoin by any means. Virtually all payment networks scale in layers with the possible exception of physical cash, the bearer instrument. For example, credit card transactions from payment networks like Visa are intermediated by many, many different systems, including banks, payment processors, networks like Fedwire or ACH, and they ultimately settle weeks or months after the point of an exchange. So how is Bitcoin scaling today? Categorically, I think there are three big buckets to consider. The first is layer two, primarily focused on Lightning. L2 solutions scale settlement insurances of the Bitcoin base layer with deferred settlement. This means that balances are ultimately settled on the base layer, but not necessarily at the point of a transaction. The second categorical approach is the sidechain, which was conceptually proposed by Blockstream several years ago in 2014. Sidechain scale settlement insurances by pegging Bitcoin onto another chain, which can maintain an independent security model of the Bitcoin blockchain. Sidechains come in all flavor, flavors, including federated chains, which rely on a trusted validator set, more trusted trust minimized models, which allow Bitcoin to be able to used on other permissionless layer one blockchains like Ethereum. The third approach is scaling Bitcoin off chain through Bitcoin banks. Today, there are hundreds of Bitcoin exchanges globally, which all help scale settlement insurances using financial intermediaries. The critical link between all three classes of scaling solution is that they allow users to make trade-offs in the settlement insurances they get from Bitcoin. For example, a large institution making a Bitcoin transfer may naturally transact on layer one. An application requiring a lot of microtransactions might be hosted on layer two and so on. To dig into the first solution, layer two systems like Lightning scale Bitcoin payments with deferred settlement. What is deferred settlement? Deferred settlement is really simple. It's like maintaining a tab at a bar. Like going to a bar, opening up a tab, and then settling at the end of the night, Lightning lets you open up a payment channel with a counterparty by setting up a funding transaction through multi-sig at the base layer. When you leave your credit card with the bartender, you're effectively opening up a payment channel, just like in Lightning. The bartender updates the state of the channel after every beer you order. At the time that you hand your bartender the card, your beers are effectively paid for even if you forget your card. The bartender can always settle at the end of the night and probably leave themselves a nice tip in the process. Similarly, Lightning allows users to independently skip, settle to the base layer of Bitcoin blockchain anytime that they have a dispute, just like they would if they had an issue with a credit card company. The Lightning network itself is a mesh composed of many different payment channels. As long as you have a payment channel that's actively funded, it can interface with any other payment channel without requiring you to go back to the Bitcoin blockchain. Most importantly, Lightning's security is proximate to the Bitcoin base layer. Counterparties are always able to settle back to the Bitcoin blockchain in the case of dispute. 
there's there's about 1800 bitcoin observable on lightning today and the lightning network has steadily gone so growing capacity over the last few years in bitcoin terms this represents about 50 million us dollars in liquidity today lightning is also useful because it enables the native programming by lightning bitcoin and it extends the bitcoin script that's available on the base layer this is particularly useful for applications that require high transaction throughput applications like sphinx chat which are enabled by Lightning and do valuable work on Lightning developer SDKs, which are supported by Square and many other ecosystem participants. Moving to the next model of layered blockchain scaling, sidechains can help scale the Bitcoin base layer by pegging Bitcoin onto an independently secured chain. One of the most notable sidechain designs is Liquid. Liquid uses a federated security model and can be used to settle faster Bitcoin transactions between businesses. Liquid runs on a two-way peg, moving Bitcoin between the Bitcoin blockchain and the Liquid sidechain at a one-to-one -one rate. In Liquid, a group of trusted validators rather than miners receive transactions and broadcast valid blocks. Since Liquid is primarily used to transfer Bitcoin between businesses, validators are mostly major crypto exchanges and trading firms, although anyone can use Liquid. Since Liquid relies on a trusted federation for security, block times and confirmation thresholds can be different than on the Bitcoin blockchain. On the main Bitcoin blockchain, blocks come out every 10 minutes. However, on Liquid, they're produced every one minute. Generally, most exchanges require six or more confirmations on the Bitcoin blockchain. However, transactions are generally considered con confirmed after only a couple of out blocks on Liquid. These are all social, this is all effectively social consensus that users can converge on based on the trade-offs that they've considered and the settlement insurances that they, they consider important. In Liquid, these settlement insurances can be different because of the validators that are participating in the system and the fact that most of them are trusted intermediaries already. As seen below, the Liquid Federation has many members, including many global exchanges. Another system being used to scale Bitcoin payments and usage today is Ethereum, the second largest permissionless blockchain. Today, over 255,000 Bitcoin, or about 1.2% of the fully diluted Bitcoin supply, $8 billion worth, is tokenized on Ethereum. There are many different versions of tokenized Bitcoin on Ethereum. The most popular is WBTC, custodial Bitcoin peg, operated by a trusted group of depository institutions, primarily large global exchanges like BitGo or Coinbase. WBTC can be, can be issued on Ethereum first by depositing Bitcoin with a custodian, who then gives you an ERC-20, which can then be used on Ethereum, as illustrated in the diagram below. Once the Bitcoin is tokenized on Ethereum, it can be used pretty much anywhere. An ERC-20 token can be used. In the case of WBTC, it's often used to uh, in decentralized applications in Ethereum, such as the money market compound, as seen below. Over a billion dollars of WBTC is currently supplied in Compound and earning yield. You can imagine that Bitcoin can be used in other applications such as decentralized exchanges, decentralized financial products, and even Bitcoin margin derivatives, all powered by sidechains. In addition to scaling Bitcoin through on-chain layers like Liquid or Lightning and sidechains like Ethereum, Financial institutions play a really major role in scaling the usage of Bitcoin. While the idea of using banks to scale Bitcoin might seem counterintuitive and perhaps counter to the cypherpunk ethos that Bitcoin had to begin with, from the very beginning, Bitcoin was built with the idea that it can serve as a base layer for reserve currency that can then be used by banks to scale. As Halfpenny pointed out as early as 2010, it's possible that in the future, most Bitcoin transactions occur between banks and that base layer Bitcoin transactions are executed by, that are executed by individuals are exceedingly rare. As Hall put it in this post, it might be as rare as buying Bitcoin in 2010. Today, about 8% of Bitcoin is held by exchanges. This is likely a lower bound. So it does appear that Hal was somewhat prophetic. There are many different protocols such as proof of reserve, which can preserve Bitcoin's base layer guarantees. Proof of reserve allows exchanges to prove attestations of the Bitcoin that's held so that we're not reliant on some of the issues that a fractional reserve bank might have uh, or present in the rehypothecation of Bitcoin. To conclude, 
The thesis that many present is that Bitcoin's base layer is unscalable. As we've seen, this is false. The antithesis that many present is that Bitcoin's base layer scales limitlessly. As we've seen, this is also false. It presents many issues, including the co or in raising the cost of validating a full node. In fact, the synthesis is that Bitcoin settlement insurances can securely scale in layers, that users that wish to pay more higher transaction fees or deal with longer confirmation times, et cetera, can use the base layer Bitcoin blockchain. This might be used for high value transactions. Users that need, or applications that need or rely on microtransactions can transact on layer two, such as Lightning. Still more trusted applications, which might require even more transaction throughput, or even new applications such as credit, can use side chains like Ethereum or Liquid. And that presents a different set of settlement insurances of trade-offs that users can accept. And still, most users may end up transacting in Bitcoin through off-chain banks or off-chain solutions like Coinbase or BlockFi, or many of the large Bitcoin banks that exist today. Thank you. My name is Nate Madri. I'm a senior research analyst at Coinmetrics. And today I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin ownership concentration and some of the myths surrounding it. So Bitcoin supply is sometimes reported as being concentrated or controlled by whales. But how concentrated is it really and how can we measure it? So here are two real headlines. The first one reads over 99% of the current Bitcoin supply is held by only 10% of Bitcoin addresses. The second reads, Bitcoin whales ownership concentration is rising during rally. And this is an excerpt from that second article. A few large holders, commonly referred to as whales, continue to own most Bitcoin. About 2% of the anonymous ownership accounts that can be tracked on the cryptocurrency's blockchain control 95% of the digital asset. Now, while this is technically true, it is true that 99% of Bitcoin supply is held in 10% 10 of Bitcoin addresses. This is misleading because it's implying that the supply is controlled by individuals or a few large holders, while in reality, this, this is not necessarily the case. And I'm going to go into much more details about why exactly this is misleading. But first, I think it's important to understand how we measure Bitcoin supply and how we measure Bitcoin supply concentration. So Bitcoin supply data is completely public and verifiable. Bitcoin is a pretty unprecedented uh, financial data set in, in this sense because every single Bitcoin transaction since its inception has been publicly recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain. 
Furthermore, anyone can run their own Bitcoin node, which is really just a piece of free open source software to view and verify the complete transaction history of Bitcoin. And that's a lot of what we do at CoinMetrics. We run our own Bitcoin nodes and other cryptocurrency nodes so we can verify the, the entire transaction history. Now, in the context of kind of traditional banking and traditional financial transactions, this is pretty unheard of. Um, traditional banking transactions are inherently private, while Bitcoin's entire history is completely public. Um, so in, in addition to be able to verify the supply, this also lets us be able to create metrics on top of the supply and kind of get a deeper analysis of exactly what's going on. You can see in this image here some of the data that's included with and viewable with Bitcoin transactions. Each transaction has its own unique ID, which is called a hash. You can see exactly how much Bitcoin is sent in each transaction, and you can see which addresses it's sent to. So building off of that transparent supply data lets us compute metrics like this. And this is, are some of the metrics that, that were cited in the original article. So first here, we're seeing that the blue line on the top of this chart shows Bitcoin's total current supply. And we see it's increased over time. We can track it to a very precise degree. We also see this, this green line here, which shows the amount of Bitcoin supply held in the top 10% of addresses. And then the red line is the amount of supply held in the top 1% of addresses. So at first glance, this does look like supply is heavily concentrated as those articles were implying, but there's a really important caveat here, and that's that this is showing the amount of Bitcoin supply controlled by the top 10% of addresses and not necessarily the top 10% of individuals. So a Bitcoin address isn't necessarily an individual, and this is a common misconception with Bitcoin and crypto addresses in general. An address can represent many individuals, and an individual can also own many addresses. So for example, exchanges, institutions, multi-sig wallets um, may have a few addresses that are holding Bitcoin for hundreds or sometimes even thousands of people. On the other end, end of the spectrum, an, indiv an individual can own many addresses and individual investors often will hold many different Bitcoin addresses for privacy or security purposes. Also, when a Bitcoin transaction is sent, a change address is needed and this can sometimes make it seem like there, there's more than one individual, while it's really just an individual who controls all of these addresses. So this shows the amount of Bitcoin held on exchanges, and this shows most of the major crypto exchanges. It does not show all of them. There, there are a bunch more as well. So if anything, this is probably even underestimating the amount of Bitcoin held on exchanges. But you can see here, there's at least 1.6 million Bitcoin held on exchanges which is about 9% of total supply, and it's increased over time. Five out of the 10 largest Bitcoin addresses belong to exchanges, including the top two largest addresses. The largest Bitcoin address is owned by Binance, who holds about 300,000 Bitcoin in, in a single address. Um, and though if you're looking on chain, it may appear like these addresses are whales or large holders who are controlling a huge amount of Bitcoin, in, real, in reality, that's not the case. These, these exchanges are holding Bitcoin on behalf typically of thousands of customers, and each individual customer can choose when to deposit or, or withdraw their, their Bitcoin from that address. In addition to exchanges, a lot of large Bitcoin addresses are controlled by what, what we commonly refer to as dormant OGs. So in Bitcoin's early his, history, very early history, it was still an experimental network and a lot of its earliest users amassed a large amount of Bitcoin and then either lost their keys or, or abandoned those addresses. And we can see two examples of that here. So the first address on the right here is a, is a Bitcoin address that controls about a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, the 26th largest address in the Bitcoin network. But that, that address that's holding a billion dollars has not had any transfers out since 2010. Um, the most famous example of these kind of dormant OG addresses is, is Satoshi Nakamoto, who of course founded Bitcoin. And uh, Satoshi is believed to own over a million Bitcoin split across various addresses. And all of that Bitcoin has not been moved after it was originally mined. Um, so when we're thinking of Bitcoin supply and we're calculating a lot of our metrics, we typically consider this type of supply to be lost 
and we exclude it from free float supply, which is basically the amount of liquid so Bitcoin supply that's available. Um, since th this billion dollars or you know these huge amounts of Bitcoins haven't moved, a lot of these keys have probably been lost, misplaced, and a, a Bitcoin key is lost. There's really no way to to retrieve it, so that supply essentially is is gone forever. Um, so th this is another example of large addresses in the top 10 percent, which at first glance could seem like huge whales, but in reality, a lot of this Bitcoin probably isn't even active anymore. Lastly, investment products. So a, a lot of Bitcoin is is increasingly being held in investment products. Grayscale is is the biggest example. Grayscale's Bitcoin Trust holds about 650,000 Bitcoin, close to 3.5% of supply. Other ETFs hold over 1% of Bitcoin supply. And there's an increasing amount of wrapped Bitcoin, WBTC, which is basically a synthetic wrapper for Bitcoin that lets Bitcoin be used on, on the Ethereum blockchain. So these, again, are all examples of, of products that might control a small group of addresses that have a large amount of Bitcoin that look like whales, but really this Bitcoin is, is controlled by hundreds or thousands of other investors. On the other end of the spectrum, there are a ton of pretty small Bitcoin addresses. So out of the 38 million Bitcoin addresses that hold a balance, uh, hold a balance about 5.8 million hold less than $1 worth of Bitcoin. And a lot of these small addresses also don't represent individuals. They're either tiny addresses that have been abandoned or they're addresses where a single individual will own a, a bunch of these smaller addresses. There are over 855,000 dust addresses on Bitcoin and a dust address is, is an address that's holding such a small amount of Bitcoin that it's not even really worth transferring it out of that address because the trans transaction fee would be too high to make it worth it. So these smaller addresses further kind of skew this data because there's so many of these tiny addresses that also do not represent individuals, but it makes it look like supply is, is concentrated at the top um, when really, again, these, these addresses aren't individuals at all. So it can be tempting to compare Bitcoin supply distribution to U.S. wealth distribution or another fiat currency's wealth distribution. We've all seen this chart or something similar. This shows the U.S. wealth distribution, which, of course, is, is pretty heavily weighted towards the top 1%. But this is really not a like-to-like -like comparison since these wealth distributions are showing the wealth distribution of individuals. And like I just went over, Bitcoin supply distribution is showing that distribution of addresses and not individuals. Um, instead, it's better to understand how Bitcoin's unique supply issuance works and unique supply distribution method works, and then compare it to other cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin was designed to have fair, transparent supply issuance. And here's how Bitcoin supply issuance works. So every time a Bitcoin block is successfully mined, the miner who, who won the block earns newly issued Bitcoin as a reward. And at Bitcoin's inception, this block reward started off at 50 Bitcoin per block, which is a lot. And then every four years since then, it's been cut in half. That reward has been cut in half. And we see that here in this chart. So it started off at 50, then got cut to 25, etc. And that halving process will keep on occurring until Bitcoin's maximum supply of 21 million is eventually reach. Now, this supply issuance method is really important because it's how Bitcoin supply gets out in the first place. It's how it's distributed. But it's also really key for securing the network. So this block reward is the main part of what incentivizes miners to contribute energy and, and contribute hash rate to the network, which is ultimately what secures the Bitcoin network and keeps Bitcoin safe. It's also important to note that all of Bitcoin supply has been released this way. It's, it's all been issued through block rewards, which is not the case for, for every cryptocurrency. And in fact, most other cryptocurrencies do not have their entire supply released this way. They have other, other initial methods of releasing their supply. So that's how Bitcoin supply is initially issued. But after it's given to these miners, how does it get distributed to other holders? So Bitcoin miners, like I said, earn, earn their revenue in Bitcoin. Uh, most of their revenue comes from these block rewards. They also earn transaction fees. Every time a Bitcoin transaction is sent, the sender needs to pay a fee in Bitcoin, and those fees also go to the miners. 
So these miners are earning all of their revenue in Bitcoin, but most of their expenses need, still need to be paid out in their local fiat currency. That, that might eventually change. They might eventually be able to pay in, in Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency. But today they still mostly need to pay their expenses in fiat. And expenses are things like electricity, hardware, rent, um, and these things are, you know, aren't, aren't typically accepting Bitcoin as payment yet. So because of this, this helps naturally distribute Bitcoin supply. If, if the miners want to remain profitable over the long term, they're going to have to eventually sell some of their Bitcoin. Different miners have different methods and strategies for doing this. Some just sell Bitcoin at you know, predetermined intervals, but and some hold it for longer. But again, if they want to remain profitable, they're going to have to sell some of this Bitcoin. And here, this chart is a really interesting example of, of that phenomenon and that distribution method. So what this is showing here is this, the purple, so th this is the percent of total Bitcoin supply held by different groups of addresses, <clears throat> where each address is holding a different amount of Bitcoin. And I'll explain exactly what that means. So this, this purple area here shows the total percent of Bitcoin held by addresses that are each individually holding between 10 and 100 Bitcoins. So in Bitcoin's very early years, kind of 2009, 2010, we can see that pretty much 100% of supply was held in these addresses that each individually held between 10 and 100 Bitcoin. That, that changed over time. But the reason for that is because, as I just explained, the initial block rewards were 50 Bitcoins. So when these early miners got their 50 Bitcoin, most of them just let it let it sit there in an address. They they didn't really transfer it. They you know they didn't necessarily collect more. Um, there wasn't too much you could really do with with Bitcoin in the early days, and a lot of them were still kind of viewing Bitcoin as an experiment. So most of the addresses were holding 50 or 100 Bitcoin in, in that range. We we didn't really see that change until July 2010 when something pretty interesting happened. So in in July 2010 we see this blue area of the chart start to emerge. And the blue area represents the amount of supply held in addresses that are each holding between one and 10 Bitcoin. So before that point, there were basically no addresses that were holding less than, than 10 Bitcoin, which is pretty crazy. Um, but we see this blue area emerge, more, more Bitcoin supply is held in these smaller addresses that each hold between one and 10. And then a little later, we see the yellow area emerge, which is the amount of supply held in addresses each holding between zero and one Bitcoin. So what's happening here is that in July 2010 was when the first Bitcoin exchange came online, the infamous Mt. Gox, which, which later got hacked and is, is no longer online. But basically what ended up, ended up happening is these early miners started selling some of their Bitcoin when, when the exchange came online. And that helped naturally start distributing Bitcoin to these smaller holders. So we see, we're seeing this distribution play out in, in real time in this chart. It is important to know that this is on a log scale, just so we can really see it. it. It makes it look a little more extreme than it was, still only kind of like less than 2% or so of total supply was held by these small addresses. But still, this is showing how this distribution method started. So this is a similar chart, but zoomed out over a longer time period, and it's on a linear scale instead of log. But we're seeing a similar pattern here. So. The, the dark blue area is the amount of total Bitcoin held in addresses that are each holding between 10 and 100 Bitcoin. Same thing, those addresses in the early days controlled all of Bitcoin. But then over time, that Bitcoin started getting more and more distributed to smaller addresses, as well as concentrated to some, small, to some larger addresses. So the pink area at the top is showing addresses that each hold at least 10,000 Bitcoin, the total amount of Bitcoin held by those addresses, which there are very few of. Then the lighter blue area is the amount of Bitcoin held in addresses that are holding between 1,000 to 10,000 Bitcoin. And again, it might look like these large addresses are holding a relatively large amount of supply, but a lot of these, these addresses, especially the very large ones, are exchanges or other institutions which are holding Bitcoin on, on behalf of others. So this is another way of viewing Bitcoin supply distribution. And instead of grouping it by addresses that are holding an absolute amount of Bitcoin, this is showing it by group by addresses that are holding a certain percent of Bitcoin supply. So the blue area on the top in this case is showing addresses that each individually hold at least 0.1% of Bitcoin's total supply. 
which is a very large amount. So those are very large addresses, ranging all the way down to the bottom and showing the amount of Bitcoin held by small addresses, um, held by addresses each holding less than one, one 100 millionth of, of supply. So the reason I'm showing it this way as opposed to the last one is just because this is going to make it a little easier to compare Bitcoin supply distribution to other cryptos. But we can see here that um, by this grouping as well, Bitcoin supply is actually fairly well distributed amongst these different address sizes. So here's the distribution of Ethereum's native token, Ether. And we can see that comparatively a larger percent of ETH supply is held by the largest addresses at the top. So similar thing, the, the dark blue area at the top is showing the amount of ETH held in addresses that each individually hold at least 0.1% of supply. And compared to, to Bitcoin, Ethereum had a little bit of a different initial supply issuance method. Ethereum had an initial public sale where people could buy ETH, um, which is different from Bitcoin, where it was all issued to early miners. And we see that play out in this chart. And if you look at the left hand side of the chart, Ethereum started pretty, pretty heavily concentrated. It's gotten less concentrated over time. But the initial distribution method and distribution patterns look different from Bitcoin's chart, which we just saw. It is important to know, though, that, that similar to Bitcoin, Ethereum has many addresses like exchanges that hold ETH on behalf of others. It also has a lot of smart contracts like the Ethereum 2.0 smart deposit smart contract that are holding large amounts of ETH on, on uh, behalf of indi individual investors. DeFi smart contracts are, are doing something similar. DeFi lending protocols are holding ETH and smart contracts, which is controlled by a bunch of indiv individual investors. So that same caveat definitely applies for, for Ethereum. And this is Dogecoin's distribution. Dogecoin is even more heavily concentrated than ETH. There's actually a single Doge address that controls about 28% of total supply, which is pretty crazy because for context, the largest Bitcoin address, which belongs to Binance, controls about 1.6% of total supply. And again, the Doge address can, controls 28% of total supply. Unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum, however, the owner of this large Doge address is not really publicly known. We can also see that Doge's supply has been getting more concentrated over time. More and more Doge has been going to these really large addresses. This metric is network distribution factor, aka NDF, which is a way to compare Bitcoin's or crypto's supply distributions a little more directly. The way that this is calculated is it's by taking a ratio of supply held by large addresses over the, the total supply of that crypto. So it's basically the aggregate supply held in addresses, which each individually holds at least 0.0001% of supply divided by the, the total supply. So a low NDF indicates a relatively distributed supply. Bitcoin has a relatively low NDF of about 0.35. Bitcoin is all the way at the bottom. It's the, the red line there. And then we can see Ethereum or Ether, which is um, the kind of darkish green line in the middle is, is in the middle here. Doge is orange, a, a little uh, above it. So it's a little more concentrated than ETH. But then there are also cryptos that are, <clears throat> that are above Doge. So at the very top, we see XLM, which is Stellar, and XRP, which are Ripple. Both of these had pre-mines or pre-sales. And they also have foundations that hold a large amount of, of their crypto assets. We see a couple of stable coins here. The, the yellow line is USDC. The kind of purplish line, purple pink, is Tether, the Ethereum version of Tether, both of which started off almost completely concentrated and have been getting more distributed over time with, with natural usage. And then at the very bottom of the chart, we can see an orangest line forking off of Bitcoin, and that's Bitcoin Cash. That one's interesting because Bitcoin Cash um, literally forked from Bitcoin in 2017. And when it forked, the supply concentration was exactly the same. But over time, Bitcoin Cash has been getting more and more concentrated. Um, there's also a line that forks up Bitcoin Cash, which is Bitcoin SV. It's a little less concentrated than Bitcoin Cash, but it's still more concentrated than, than Bitcoin, which again, just shows the importance of, of that initial supply distribution method and also just speaks to, to Bitcoin's decentralization in general. 
So over time, more and more Bitcoin has been getting distributed to addresses holding small yet significant amounts. This chart shows the total amount of supply held by addresses with zero to one Bitcoin. Um, addresses holding less than one Bitcoin now collectively hold almost a million Bitcoin. And addresses with between 0 0.01 and one Bitcoin now collectively hold about 740,000 Bitcoin. And that's the red area um, on this chart. So, and again, going back to the beginning of this chart and beginning of Bitcoin, we can see there were basically no addresses holding um, less than one Bitcoin. So it's pretty remarkable how, how distributed this has gotten over time and it's continuing to get distributed today. So in conclusion, despite misleading headlines, Bitcoin has a unique fair issuance me mechanism, which has led to supply getting more distributed over time. And with the growth of Bitcoin payment mechanisms like, like and services like Square, with the introduction of Bitcoin as legal tender in El Salvador, it will undoubtedly only continue to, to get more distributed as time goes on. If you'd like to explore the data used in this presentation, please check out charts.coinmetrics.io. Um, you can check it out for free and download a lot of this data. And that's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel to reach out on Twitter at Coinmetrics or at Nate Madry. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lynn Alden of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, uh, a firm that focuses on providing market research for institutional and retail investors about a, a variety of different asset classes, uh, including digital assets. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the misconception that Bitcoin is easy to displace, uh, that basically the, you know, the probability that another blockchain could come along and, and you know, be superior to Bitcoin in most, most or all metrics. Uh, and so let's dive right in. Uh, so. If we, if we take a step back, basically, when we talk about the success of cryptocurrency, it's reliant uh, in very many ways on the network effect, which is also how protocols and, uh, you know, social media platforms and a variety of other things derive their value. And so when it comes to blockchains, the stronger the network effect, the better the security and development enjoys, resulting in an entrenched advantage that gives it, a, a, you know, a, an almost insurmountable, uh, you know, gap compared to competition. Uh, and so when we look at the history of Bitcoin, it's gone through basically four cycles uh, of growth. And so far, those have, have correlated, uh, you know, people can debate how causation uh, plays here, but they've been rather correlated to Bitcoin's halving cycle. And so every four years, uh, Bitcoin is pre-programmed to change the number of, of new coins that are generated every 10 minutes. And so during the course of its, of its almost 13-year history, it's gone through this period 
where every four years is a, a smaller number of coins generated. Uh, and but you know when that happens, when that kind of that difficulty, that that uh, that new coin uh, generation kicks in, uh, that generally results in basically a, a supply shock. You could say basically the, the market had already settled on a certain supply demand uh, balance, and when that new supply gets cut in half, uh, that has historically led to, or at least been correlated with, a price increase, and that has often resulted in in periodic bubbles uh, that capture media attention. Then there's a you know a correction. You know, Bitcoin uh, most like you know uh, frequently has been labeled dead, uh, but then it recovers and continues on going forward. And so it's it's been rather volatile. But when we zoom out and look at this logarithmic view of the price, it's actually been the steady state of increases. And of course, the big question is how long will this continue? Will this you know reach a certain plateau of of you know multi-trillion dollar asset uh, and go up from there, or will this eventually roll over and be surpassed by either some other technology? Or will the whole, you know, space just no longer be effective? And you know, most signs point to that. You know, the network effect continues to be extremely strong, and we're going to walk through some of the steps here. And so, you know, overall, Bitcoin's irreplaceable attributes largely rest on three different categories: so there's security, scale, and decentralization. And so they all play into each other as well. So security can help increase its scale. Scale can help increase its security. Uh, but basically, we, when we analyze the the qualities of the network. We can go through these three areas. And so, for example, in terms of security, Bitcoin's hash rate and simple base layer uh, give it more assurances as a, as a way to store value or transmit value than, than every other blockchain. When we look at scale, of course, Bitcoin's largest uh, protocol by market capitalization is also one of the largest protocols in terms of development network uh, and how much value is transmitted any given period of time. Uh, and then in terms of decentralization, Basically, there's more of a division of powers in the Bitcoin network compared to most other cryptocurrencies, even ones that are also pretty big on terms of scale. And so the next few slides will dive into these three individually with more detail. So if you focus on security, uh, when it comes to a proof of work protocol, uh, scale uh, is a very big factor. And so you know, what this chart on the right shows is Bitcoin's hash rate. So it's a rough measure of how much processing power is used to secure the network. Uh, compared to some of its copies, like uh, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, that have you know they've they've taken the blockchain, they've forked off, they've made their own changes, uh, and so what we see is that Bitcoin has orders of magnitude more, uh, you know, uh, security than those other offshoots. And analogy that I've seen used, for example, is that almost anyone you know could could copy and host uh, Wikipedia, right? So Wikipedia is not that much data. You could copy it. You could put it on your own website. Uh, but what is the chance that you'd be able to actually get the traffic that Wikipedia has? Uh, and the chance, of course, is almost zero, because even though you could replicate, you know, the current state of Wikipedia, you'd be unable to replicate the, you know, the millions and millions of links around the world pointing to Wikipedia. You'd be unable to, you know, uh, capture a large percentage of the user base that continually updates Wikipedia to instead go and update your version, right? So basically, Wikipedia's network effect is so entrenched that merely copying it. Is, is insufficient to become a, an actual competitor to Wikipedia. And so the same applies to blockchains. You can copy a blockchain, you can, you can make your own blockchain, but unless you reach that critical mass of millions and millions of users uh, with a well-designed protocol and appropriate decentralization and uh, high levels of security, the blockchain is not going to be effective. And so there's only a couple of blockchains that have really kind of reached that critical mass. And among them, Bitcoin has very unique characteristics. Uh, and so there's a variety of reasons that that basically Bitcoin is more secure than its competing protocols. And so the fact that it uses dedicated ASICs, uh, for example, in its mining algorithm means that not only do you have to pay for electricity in order to, to mine Bitcoin, you also need to actually acquire dedicated hardware. So unlike a GPU-based blockchain, you can't merely rent, say, cloud GPUs to attack the blockchain you'd actually need to, to somehow acquire the majority of the over 51% of the dedicated mining hardware. Uh, and so overall, Bitcoin has had 13 years almost of uninterrupted uh, uptime. Uh, and that's uh, in large part based on the fact that it has a, a tighter and larger security network than every other blockchain out there. Uh, and you know what's often called a, a, a bug is actually a feature it, is the fact that Bitcoin is very simple, right? So Many other blockchains try to do more on the base layer, whereas Bitcoin is purposely very simple on the base layer. That gives it fewer attack services. That gives it fewer uh, risks for bugs or unknown outcomes. 
of, of different types of transactions. It's basically a very simple base layer and then any additional complexity that the ecosystem might want can be built on top of it uh, in additional layers or side chains, uh, or there can be other blockchains for other purposes. Uh, but basically, you know, Bitcoin itself is designed to do uh, a small number of things very, very well. And you know, for, for 13 years, that's what it's done. And so generally when you hear about a, a blockchain that offers more capability on the base layer, or that you know, has you know, more transaction throughput, or whatever the case may be, it's always important to ask yourself, what are the trade-offs that that blockchain is making? Because you have to realize that Bitcoin, you know, the limitations that it has are there for a reason. Those are a specific set of design choices to maximize certain areas over other areas. And so whenever those, those variables are tweaked by another blockchain, they're sacrificing some, some aspects generally related to security or decentralization in order to achieve uh, you know, more capability on the base layer. Uh, so next, we'll take a look at scale. Uh, and so, of course, Bitcoin has the largest market capitalization uh, with estimated to be well over 100 million users at this point. Uh, and that includes on-chain users as well as users on exchanges or other providers. Uh, and so if that number is correct, and many uh, estimates have pointed in that direction, that means Bitcoin has so far uh, reached, reached a higher level of adoption than the Internet did by this point in its life cycle. And so it's being adopted very quickly. It's the fastest asset to touch a trillion dollar market capitalization. Uh, and then, you know, when you include uh, not only the base layer, but also additional layers like Lightning uh, and Liquid, uh, as well as various uh, side chains or, or other things in the ecosystem, uh, and then all the variety of apps and hardware devices that are either Bitcoin specific uh, or, or Bitcoin first, kind of focused on Bitcoin, uh, it has, you know, uh, one of the largest uh, overall networks in the blockchain space. And again, the more development that goes on, the better and better the system gets and the bigger that gap becomes compared to the other blockchains uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, and so when we look at, for example, hardware wallets, uh, so there's many hardware wallets that accept multiple different coins, but then there are also hardware wallets that are Bitcoin only, that only work with Bitcoin uh, by design uh, to enhance their security and be more specialized. And so what that ultimately means is that, for example, Bitcoin has a greater range of hardware selection than other, other coins in the space. Uh, and that also applies to there's a variety of apps that only work with Bitcoin. Uh, and so in many ways, Bitcoin's ecosystem overlaps with the broader crypto space, but also has a very own dedicated uh, Bitcoin focused part of its ecosystem. And so when you include all these different layers, Bitcoin's development network is very, very big. An analogy I like to use uh, that, that uh, you know, other great uh, uh, you know, research in the space have used uh, is that it's, it's more like a protocol than anything else. And so, you know, often people ask themselves, okay, when is Bitcoin going to be replaced by a better competitor? It, it's, it's, it operates in technology. And so naturally we have to look to see what's going to be better. Uh, now, however, when you look at protocols in the technology realm, uh, protocols tend to be very, very long lasting. And that's because they achieve a certain critical mass that, you know, that acceptance is what makes them valuable. And so an example is TCP IP. Uh, as I speak right now, I mean, t that, that protocol is between four and five decades old and it's still the backbone of the internet and 20 years from now it'll still be the backbone of the internet and of course the internet over time changes very rapidly but that underlying foundation for how it works is actually rather static and rather consistent and so bitcoin in many ways is adopting that approach where the base layer is this you know purposely simple robust platform for uh, uh, storing and transmitting value uh, and then all these other complexities can be added to it on top of it or alongside of it uh, in different ways. Uh, but that underlying foundation doesn't have to, nor should it, change rapidly. Another example would be, for example, USB. Uh, and so USB at this point is almost uh, 25 years old, uh, and it, it's gone through three major upgrades over that time that are generally backwards compatible or can be made backwards compatible with the prior versions to get faster over time. And so, for example, if you were to come along and say, I made a better uh, TCP IP, uh, basically a better way to run the internet, or I've made a, a slightly better USB, you have to ask yourself, what is the chance that your protocol could catch on when those other protocols already have billions of users? And so at that point, they're not even competing purely on technology. They're competing on the fact that they're already so widely accepted uh, that it's very, very hard to displace them as long as they continue to be a good foundation for updating over time, which again is what Bitcoin has become. So lastly, we can focus on decentralization. 
And this is where, for example, it's useful to compare, say, Bitcoin and Ethereum, because Ethereum is the other blockchain in the space that does have a very large market capitalization uh, and development network as well. So that's the other blockchain that has a large network effect. Uh, but that's where that similarity ends, because they actually have very different qualities uh, in, in many other areas. And one of them is decentralization. So on the right here, we see for Bitcoin and Ethereum as examples, uh, we see how much total supply they have, and then also how much new supply is issued per year. Uh, and so with the with the chart of Bitcoin on top, for example, we see that it's that its supply uh, and its issuance rate is very algorithmic. Uh, so from inception, it had a certain pattern that it was going to do, and it's done that perfectly uh, since inception. Uh, and that's because you know there's really it would take uh, almost unanimous consensus by the Bitcoin community in order to change that outcome, right? So you would need node operators, you would need miners. Uh, and developers who basically all conspire to change Bitcoin's monetary policy. Uh, whereas Ethereum, when we look at Ethereum at the at the bottom there, so Ethereum has a different design philosophy. So they use, for example, difficulty bombs on the, the blockchain in order to basically uh, force a, a quicker update path uh, than, say, Bitcoin has. And so what that essentially does is it gives the developers more influence over that network uh, than developers have over the Bitcoin network. And so, for example, big, uh, Ethereum's issuance rate is, has been more variable. The monetary policy is prone to changes. And, you know, depending on, on how you look at it, that could be considered a feature or a bug. Obviously, people in the community have different uh, ways of looking at that. But the point is, those are two very different design philosophies. So one has been more prone to change, whereas one is more prone to basically, you know, you have a very high probability of being able to understand Bitcoin's monetary policy looking out five or 10 years. Uh, compared to a protocol like Ethereum. Uh, and so, you know, when we look at this, when you, when you look at a, a competing blockchain, whether it's, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's one of the other protocols out there, you have to ask yourself between the nodes, the miners and the developers, uh, who has, you know, the primary amount of control. Uh, and so, for example, in Bitcoin, because nodes by design are easy for uh, someone with a basic computer and a basic internet connection to run, that means there's a very, very large number of people that store the full node uh, and that therefore, if miners conspire to change something about the blockchain, their ability to get past that full node network is limited, right? So the nodes is, essentially have a large degree of power in that network. Uh, whereas when you look at other systems, other blockchains that, you know, they make their base layer far more complex, it makes it very, very hard for users to run their own full node. Uh, and so that, you know, basically centralizes power more in the hands of the miners or the developers, and it becomes a, a more company-like system rather than a, a protocol, a decentralized protocol. Uh, and so when we when we think about different types of blockchain, it's important to always be aware of the trade-offs and understand that part of what has made Bitcoin successful is that by keeping the base layer simple, by keeping the nodes small and easy to operate, it has achieved a level of decentralization that is very, very hard for other blockchains to replicate uh, and it, because, you know, all the features that they're adding are also adding complexity to that, that, that process of running a, your own full node. Uh, and so basically to summarize, we can compare Bitcoin to MySpace because that's an often, uh, you know, way of thinking about it among investors that are maybe cautious about, uh, you know, uh, uh, wondering if Bitcoin is going to uh, be displaced or not. And so MySpace, of course, is a well-known example of a social media network. It launched shortly before, before Facebook, but it was eventually surpassed by Facebook, a later competitor. Uh, but there are some differences to be aware of. And so, for example, Bitcoin reached a trillion dollar market capitalization and continues to be the leading cryptocurrency almost 13 years into its existence, whereas MySpace reached a, a peak market capitalization of about 12 billion five years into its existence and then was surpassed and it quickly fell in, in market capitalization. And so, you know, Bitcoin has already reached a level of scale. Uh, and, and basically market dominance that is very different than MySpace reached and for a longer period of time. Another difference is that, you know, Bitcoin uh, came after Bitgold, Hashcash, and B-Money. So it's not the first one to do what it's done. It's just the first one that put enough pieces together in order to achieve the wide success that basically paved the way for all these other cryptocurrencies. And so, uh, uh, so it's not necessarily the first or oldest technology. It's actually, you know, when it came, it was actually, you know, relying on, uh, you know, at that point, decades of prior work. 
And then lastly, you know, as we said before, Bitcoin is largely following the path of a protocol rather than a company, whereas many other uh, blockchains in the space end up looking more like a company in the sense that they're still very reliant on their founders, still very reliant on a centralized development team, whereas Bitcoin at this point is more distributed. Uh, and so whereas MySpace, of course, as a company, it followed the path of company. It had an early management change early on. And for example, uh, you know, they were slow to adopt to the, you know, the, the shifting uh, user base towards mobile phones. Uh, and so that was the, a key reason why they eventually fell uh, to later networks. Uh, whereas Bitcoin continues to optimize uh, exactly what it tries to optimize for. So basically, it's, you know, the fact that there's not that many features on the base layer is again by design. And so it's not being surpassed in terms of technology by other protocols. Uh, it's not being uh, overcome by later developments because every one of those developments comes with trade-offs uh, in a way that Bitcoin has, as you know, that that ecosystem has chosen not to adopt, at least not on the base layer, in order to ensure some of those prior attributes of security and decentralization. So basically, one way, another way of looking at it is that Part of Bitcoin's success, in addition to being um, a well-designed protocol, is the path dependence. It's very, very hard to replicate Bitcoin's unique path dependence at this point. Uh, and so what I mean by that is Bitcoin was made by a creator that was, you know, eventually left the ecosystem. Uh, he remains unknown or they. Uh, and whereas many other, other cryptocurrency projects are, they take more of the path of a company where they generally have, it's harder for them to achieve a level of decentralization. Uh, and it's harder for them to uh, basically follow this very, very, uh, you know, uh, decentralized path that Bitcoin's gone through. It's very hard for them to distribute their coins in a fair way. And it's very hard for them to achieve the scale and the adoption that Bitcoin has. And so as full disclosure, uh, I am long Bitcoin. I own Bitcoin uh, and I also advise uh, some Bitcoin companies. But one thing I like to point out is that my research uh, company focuses on multiple asset classes. And so I'm not tied to any one asset and I'm happy to, you know, look at multiple different asset classes, both uh, outside of the cryptocurrency space and in the cryptocurrency space. And that's why, you know, in many ways, I've, I've continued to focus on Bitcoin, in my view, as the as a primary cryptocurrency that offers a lot of value and that is unlikely to be surpassed anytime soon by, uh, you know, a, a technology superior uh, blockchain. So thank you so much for, uh, you know, listening in and have a great day.